now let's look at it with literacy, reading and literacy, and what it's going to look like in that e-learning context. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the NAEP data, the National Assessment for Educational Progress, that indicates that only 35% of our students nationwide are considered to be proficient readers in grades three, eight, and 12. Um, and proficient means grade level. And that's a pretty stati staggering stati statistic. I'll say that again, staggering statistic, because you know literacy skills are the foundation of, of, of everything you know, in learning. And kids need to have those skills in reading and writing if they're going to be successful in answering, um, uh, answering questions and engaging in curious, uh, um, curious activities as Brandon was talking about and, and solving problems and, and questioning. So let's look at this you know, more. So, so I wanna start with just a conversation about what really you know is at the core of effective literacy instruction and um, dr richard allington one of our most key and important literacy researchers out out there in the field did a meta-analysis about eight years ago and it was published um, in uh, educational leadership and the title of the article was every child every day and he did a meta-analysis that looked at schools that had the greatest growth and student achievement and he found the first thing that he found was that they all had a very strong literacy plan. There was a strong foundation, um, and the literacy plan was um, uh, uh, the literacy um, plan was shared with everybody, and everyone followed it. So there was a common understanding. And he found these six elements. So I want to share these with you, and then let's talk about what they look like in an e-learning environment. And the first is, is that every child listens to a fluent adult read aloud. All children, including our littles, as well as our big kids, our kids who are in AP um, Econ in 11th or 12th grade, they need to see adults read. Uh, we need to model that. And so for little guys, it's listening to a fluent adult read. But then for older kids, it's about a think aloud. So kids need to see how their science teacher reads a science article and can make sense of it. They need to see that in action and have those models. And then the next one is that every child reads something he or she chooses. And this doesn't mean that every, anything goes. It doesn't mean that it's the Wild West at all. It, what it means is, is that I always refer to it as a democratic dictatorship. So I'm going to give them choices within that corpus of content that they can read. So if I'm teaching, for instance, um, I'm thinking of my fellow English majors, Rick and <laughs> Brandon, if I'm, if I'm teaching about novels, all of us don't have to read the same novel. We can read different novels and still learn about text structures and all of those literary elements. And then every child talks with peers about reading and writing. And there's a significant body of research that those who talk the most, who speak the most in a learning environment are the ones who actually learn the most. So, so when kids talk about their reading and writing, they get to those curious questions that Brandon was talking about. And, 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 and we start avoiding that lecture because it's not that dynamic um, of really exploring text, exploring ideas, and that's what rich, engaged learning is all all about. And then every child writes about something personally meaningful. And again, this doesn't mean that anything goes, that everything is just, you know, out there. What it means is, is again, kids have choice within what they're studying. So to give you an example, if I'm teaching about um, the Bill of Rights in a U.S. history class, and I want to do an evidence-based argument, that's the assignment, I want the kids to work on that skill, and I invite them to choose one of the following amendments and, 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 and whether or not that amendment is still relevant in 2020. And it's interesting because whenever I do that with um, students in classrooms, uh, they always pick about uh, quartering of soldiers. They can't understand why quartering of soldiers uh, is, is on the books and they always pick that one. So again, they have choice. They're all writing about um, uh, practicing the skill of evidence-based argument, but they have different pathways in is what we're talking about. And then the other thing too, is I know a lot 
lot of teachers who are doing this as well, is that, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And when kids write about their own stories, their own memoirs, how much more um, meaningful can that be and making sense of, of what has happened right now? And, and I know some teachers who are doing that and they're teaching about memoir and using it in comparison with other texts like um, uh, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass or um, the diary of Anne Frank. So, so that's what we're talking about. That's the engagement, the curiosity, the pathway in. And then the fifth one that Allington found is that every child reads accurately. Now, again, that means something different for the little guys and then for the big guys. For the little guys, we're talking about decoding text. We're talking about letter sound recognition, um, phonic phonemic awareness. And then we're also talking about vocabulary, especially when we get into level two, um, I'm sorry, tier two or tier three vocabulary. So if a student in a geography class comes across the word um, continent and reads it as content or content, they've got the initial, middle, and end sound correct, but they're still not decoding it correctly. And that's what we're talking about is that rich vocabulary, because of course that also ties in with comprehension of text. And then every child reads something he or she understands. And there is some debate in the reading community. I want to say on record, and this is being recorded, I'm not saying that we get rid of mentor text or grade level text. Yes, we need to have that. And we need to have text that kids can maneuver in to build their background knowledge and the skills that are associated with it. So what we, the other thing that Allington um, uh, mentions as well in his meta-analysis is that when kids read what they understand, Allington and a lot of notable neuroscientists point to this as well, it actually triggers the gray matter in your brain. And why is that important? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, it's important because when you trigger the gray matter in your brain, that's what creates those neurological connections for deeper, critical, more metaphorical, analytical kinds of thinking. Um, so then what does this look like? So let's take each element that Allington identified because that is the groundwork. That is the foundation for effective literacy instruction. And how do we transition that into a virtual environment? So every child listens to a fluent adult read aloud. There are so many Web 2.0 tools, um, applications, et cetera, that are out there. And, and the teachers that I've been working with and um, uh, district leaders and such, it, it gets overwhelming. So the ones that I'm showing, it's there's a lot more, but these are the ones that I picked. I used um, several reviews and also working in schools to really zero in on, on what I thought were, were the most effective and really um, built that element. So uh, Tumble Books, I know some of you are really familiar with that. That is a great, you know, read aloud tool. And I just found out yesterday too, that they have something called the Teen Book uh, Cloud as well. And so that's a new one. One of my all time favorites is Storyline online where you have famous celebrities like the awesome Betty White who are reading classic books um, to kids and and it's wonderfully engaging and the other thing that I like about it too is that there's a closed captioning feature uh, on that as well and then um, I of course our former first lady Michelle Obama just started this uh, I believe it was last week and she's doing a reading along with PBS um, every week as well and then a lot of prints principals, superintendents, teachers, to keep those relationships strong, they are doing their own read-alouds read as well. And then every child reads something he or she chooses, and every child reads something he or she understands. I put those together because they're so closely related. Kids generally choose what they can handle. They generally don't choose texts that are too hard for them. I know many teachers and uh, educators use ReadWorks. That's a great free site. The Library of Congress has an excellent collection where they pair primary source documents together. And what I like about that is that it's focused on a question or a topic and there's different 
um, uh, types of text. It could be a, um, uh, a recording. It could be a primary source document. It could be a visual, uh, any of those, and those are grouped together. And I love that site. Smithsonian does something similar. National Ge Geographic does as well. And then I've also created a lot of differentiated text lists that I want to um, uh, mention that as well. It's not just about getting texts that are differentiated. One of the things that we know about research is also length of text. We want kids to build stamina. The secret sauce is, is the more pages kids read, the higher the achievement. So if we keep giving kids these short works, um, we've almost like Googlified, you know, using Google or just screens of those shorter texts. And they need to be longer texts to build stamina and depth of thinking. So with that, um, uh, I developed, oh my gosh, I have so many of these lists and, and I have them for kindergarten all the way through 12th grade and different um, subject areas. So there's a great essential question first. And the essential question for this exemplar for fifth grade is um, I, uh, why is it important um, why is it important to leave your comfort zone? And so we have that great essential question. And then from there, um, I group text based on text complexity. And you notice that I don't just say Lexile, and that's a whole other conversation of why we just can't depend on Lexile. Just so you know, Hunger Games has the same Lexile as, um, uh, as Captain Underpants. So, so I just want to, you know, there's more to text complexity than just Lexile score. So you can see those grade level bands there on your left, and then all kinds of books that the kids can look at to go and, and explore that great essential question. And um, as I mentioned, I have them for all subject areas, the core subjects. And um, if you would like some of those lists, you know, just go ahead and email me and I'll be happy to share some of those lists with you. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen this graphic that when kids read an hour a day, um, uh, this is 20 minutes, but if they read 60 minutes a day, they score in the 98th percentile. So one of the things that I keep saying during the pandemic is read, just get your kids to read and be in that habit of reading and build that habit of reading. And, and, and if we do that, that is a tremendous success, educational success um, that we can have. And then every child talks with peers about reading and writing. And again, there's things that we can use on a virtual platform to promote dialogue and conversation. And that was something that Brandon said too. We know we really need to rely on that in a virtual environment is that communication. New comment, or I'm sorry, now comment is great to have like synchronous kinds of conversation. So if kids are debating or discussing or engage in a Socratic seminar, that's a really great um, uh, 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 platform. Kialo, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, kind of similar to, to new comment, um, where you can uh, explore ideas together. And those are geared more towards older kids, sixth through 12th grade. And then Flipgrid is usable for all grades as well. And that can be done um, more in an asynchronous kind of way. So kids can introduce themselves to each other. It's great for digital storytelling as well for the littles. And of course, Zoom, the platform that we're using right now. Um, uh, but those are just four ideas. And then every child writes about something personally meaningful. So again, you know, giving kids pathways to, to start developing their voice and written text. So here are four that, you know, just four, because that's the other thing too, is I don't want to overwhelm colleagues. I always say, choose one, <laughs> choose one and implement that in your virtual learning. And then once you feel comfortable with that, then add another one, but only one at a time. Um, so Kid and Storybook Maker is fabulous, especially for pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, where kids can take themselves and pictures of themselves and make their own storybook. Write about is more academic writing for primary grades. So informational text, um, creating informational text or evidence-based argumentation. Think Circa is for grades three through 12. And for full disclosure, I'm on the advisory board for Think Circa, but that is a great platform too to teach writing, highly effective. And then Write the World is a global community of young writers. And when I was exploring that earlier this week, 
you know, one of the things that they, all the kids are writing about is the pandemic and, and their firsthand experience of that. But it's real kids all over the world writing in this very public form. So I always say, think of it as book club for writers. And then of course, reading accurately, there are so many wordplay, phonics, um, uh, vocabulary games that are available. And I kind of just, I put, you know, the short list, the five that I really, really like. Um, flocabulary, I just get geeked up about flocabulary. It's one of my all-time favorite um, vocabulary um, apps. And, and as Mark mentioned, I've written a bunch of books. So um, those are some of my titles and some of the areas that I explore. But let's remember that when we talk about reading and, and, and literacy development in an online virtual environment, we gotta get back to the roots. What leads to great literacy instruction? And Allington really gave us that pathway. He gave us that keystone article. And so I always say, you know, when I'm working with schools and districts with virtual learning, I always say, let's start with what good literacy instruction is first. That's first, not the tool. We don't take the tool to just force it in there. We take what is great instruction first, to develop those skills, the background knowledge that kids need to engage in curious questions, curious inquiry. And let me just end to where, you know, I'm so proud to be an educator for over three decades. And I wanna thank everybody who's online today for all that you're doing on behalf of your colleagues, your community, but most importantly, our children. 